Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the February 12th, 2018 edition of the Weekly Top 3, our weekly 15-minute-ish podcast covering the top three things on our mind as we make the turn from the past week to the one ahead. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week you can keep track of news and our commentary on these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. You also can find this and past episodes of the weekly top three on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages and on my website at bgkeithley.com. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the big story about Alaska's fiscal situation that the Alaska news industry is missing. Second, our response to a question raised in a recent study from ICER on the recession and the fiscal crunch. And three, the Walker administration's proposed solution to oil tax credits. Our first issue today is the big story about Alaska's fiscal situation that we think the Alaska news industry is missing. Our discussion of it is triggered by a article in the Anchorage Daily News earlier today by Nat Hertz with the title, Can the Permanent Fund Save Alaska's Budget Without Taxes? The Senate says so, but it depends. And the article focuses on recent comments by Senate President Pete Kelly uh, articulating that the Alaska Senate will stand against taxes um, no matter uh, no matter what. Uh, Senator Kelly, uh, Senator Machicki are both quoted uh, in the article as taking that position. What the article alludes to, but doesn't expressly mention, is that at the same time the Senate is Senate leadership is taking that stand against taxes, they nevertheless are pushing uh, PFD cuts, cuts to the permanent fund dividend. The article refers to that uh, under the uh, euphemism, quote, use of permanent fund earnings, close quote, uh, which is the euphemism that the Senate likes to use to avoid explicitly saying that they're cutting the PFD. But nevertheless, that's the Senate's position. It's in SB 26, which is a bill that uh, the Senate has pushed both last uh, legislature and now this, uh, and it explicitly contemplates a PFD cut from roughly 50% of permanent fund earnings down to something uh, closer to uh, 25% uh, of permanent fund earnings. Now, the Senate explains that they oppose taxes because of the adverse impact uh, that they believe taxes would have on the Alaska economy and on Alaska families. But the irony of the position they're taking and the story that we think uh, the Alaska media uh, is missing is that the very solution that the Senate proposes instead to cut the PFD has an even larger impact, adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and on Alaska families. In a March 2016 study of of Alaska's various fiscal options by the Institute of Social and Economic Research, ICER, ICER concluded this, the impact of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents and it is highly regressive. So it has the largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenues raised. When you read the study, it has a larger adverse impact on the overall economy than income taxes, than sales taxes, than property taxes, than any other revenue, new revenue uh, uh, measure. So when the Senate tells you that the reason that they're blocking taxes is because they're trying to protect the economy and Alaska families, it's just wrong. Here's what ICER says about the impact on Alaska families. This is in a February 2017 uh, research summary from ICER. Quote, a cut in PFDs would be by far the costliest measure for Alaska families. Other measures, sales taxes, income taxes, would have a lower effect, a lesser effect on Alaska families. Quote, a cut in PFDs would be by far, by far, the costliest measure for Alaska families. So if your concern is about, as the Senate says it is, 
is about the Alaska economy and the effect on Alaska families, the thing that you ought to oppose most is cutting the PFD because that step, cutting the PFD, has the largest adverse effect on the overall economy and on Alaska families. And when, and when they're analyzing the, the effect on the overall economy, ICER is looking both at jobs and in income. And when you look at their study, you see their, you, you see their conclusion, their analysis and their conclusion that cutting the PFD costs the Alaska economy more jobs than an income tax and costs the Alaska economy and Alaska citizens more income than an income tax or a sales tax or a property tax. It's the worst thing. It has, cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect. So the Senate's articulated justification for, for preventing taxes, for stopping taxes, is, is, is a sham. If they were really concerned about the adverse effect on the Alaska economy, they wouldn't be proposing cutting, they wouldn't be proposing cutting the PFD. They'd be protecting that at the expense of everything else. They'd be proposing other measures rather than cutting the PFD. Something else is motivating the Alaska Senate, is motivating the governor, is motivating others. Uh, uh, the article talks about the Alaska Chamber. Something else is motivating those individuals uh, and those institutions to propose cutting the PFD. It can't be protecting the Alaska economy and protecting Alaska families because cutting the PFD has the largest adverse effect. We think the big story that the Alaska media is missing is what is the reason? Why is the Senate proposing what it's proposing to cut the PFD first and, and stop taxes? That's where the real story is. What is motivating that hypocrisy by the, by the Alaska Senate? And to our knowledge, no one in the media has yet explored that. We think they should. The second issue that we're following this week is, is raised by a paper published in late January by the Institute, Institute of Social and Economic Research. The paper is titled, What Do We Know to Date About the Alaska Recession and Fiscal Crunch? It's a good paper uh, that focuses on a lot of economic uh, data and issues around both the recession uh, and the fiscal crunch and summarizes it in a way that uh, I find very useful. But at the end of the paper, there's a very interesting question. It's under the title, uh, Some Questions and Thoughts. And here's what it says. Using the permanent fund can potentially solve a significant portion of Alaska's fiscal gap. It, however, does not necessarily address the looming question of how Alaska can have a thriving economy if oil plays a much smaller role going forward. One of the questions going forward is the extent to which the permanent fund should be used to fund business ventures in Alaska. Oil and gas used to affect the Alaska economy through both the funding of government services and the impact it had on support services. This means that the current thinking on permanent fund usage fulfills the government channel role and not the private economy. Here's the point the author's trying to make. Historically, the oil industry has funded or has been responsible for generating success in both the Alaska government sector uh, through the payment of oil taxes and royalty uh, and property taxes and in the private sector through the payments made by the oil industry to suppliers, the supplier industry in the state uh, for services rendered uh, in the oil fields and, and then through those suppliers, the trickle down on down to employees and other businesses that support that supplier industry, all going on in the private sector in the state. So the, uh, if you vis visualize it as a pyramid, the oil industry has been at the top and it's been supporting both the government sector and the private sector. The author's point is as the, as the oil industry contracts both, in, both from uh, lower uh, oil prices, and as a result, lower contributions in terms of property taxes 
uh, uh, severance taxes and royalties to the government sector, that the oil industry is also contracting as, as it develops a smaller foot, footprint, does more with few, fewer employees, that it's also contributing less to the private sector. Some people say that the permanent fund now takes the place or takes a place alongside of the oil industry in generating revenues that will go to help fund the government sector and keep the government sector running. The author is raising the question about whether we ought to be looking to the permanent fund also to put revenues into Alaska's private sector. What the author suggests are funding business ventures using permanent fund earnings to fund or permanent fund investment to fund business ventures in Alaska. Interestingly enough, this is not the first time that Alaska has been through this debate. It's risen a number of times uh, in the history of the permanent fund and in the history of permanent fund earnings as Alaska has gone through uh, these various cycles. It was commented on by Jay Hammond. Uh, there's another uh, set of comments by Scott Goldsmith uh, in a in a uh, in a in a book that's that was written along the way, um, and each time this issue has come up, um, it has been the proposal to use the permanent fund or permanent fund earnings to help fund the Alaska private sector has been rebuffed. Now there are a number of reasons for that. One we talked about last week uh, in the podcast. Uh, a concern about putting all of your putting all of Alaska's investments or all of Alaska's uh, 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 eggs in one basket, if you will. <laughs> We're already government's already dependent upon the outcome of the Alaska economy. If we recycle the permanent fund into the Alaska economy, we're just sort of doubling down uh, without getting the benefits of diversification by investing more broadly as the Alaska uh, permanent fund has done historically. But here is another concern that, that's very important uh, that, uh, that I think uh, we need to keep in mind as this issue uh, evidently is going to come up again. Here's what Hammond said uh, in Diapering the Devil about these sorts of proposals uh, to spend money investing either from the general fund or from the permanent fund, investing in Alaska businesses. Quote, those who know how to play the game are able to secure subsidies for their pet projects, many times at the collective expense of all other Alaskans. One example of this was a program granting loans not based on need at an interest rate far less than what the money could have earned in an investment account such as proposed in Alaska Inc. In one year alone, more money had been lost to the state through subsidized loans not based on need than was paid out that year in dividends, and those loans went to but 6% of the people. In other words, the money uh, that Jay is talking about was, was invested in a way that benefited 6% of the population as opposed to being used by dividend, used as dividends that benefited the entire population. Here's another way to put it. Uh, this is from Scott Goldsmith in a book entitled The Governor's Solution, How Alaska's Oil Dividend uh, Could Work in Iraq and other oil-rich countries. Scott said this, the permanent fund, one of the strengths of the permanent fund is that it, quote, has a policy of not investing in Alaska. It looks worldwide to build a portfolio to maximize long-term return on investment adjusted for risk. By doing so, the fund avoids any political pressure to funnel mon money into particular investments favored by powerful individuals or groups or to invest in local projects that produce a non-monetary benefit instead of a financial return. In short, the concern that Hammond had, Goldsmith has, others have, is if you go down this road of investing the permanent fund or earnings in Alaska businesses, it's going to be taken over by the same process that frankly goes through, goes on in Juneau. It'll be taken over by lobbyists. And the investments won't be based on what's best for, for Alaskans overall, it will be base, based on who has the best lobbyist and is able to direct the fund to their project instead of somebody else's. By far the better course, and, and we agree with this, by far the better course is to keep the permanent fund 
focus on investing globally in the best opportunities for return that are available globally, as opposed to trying to use it to generate internal investment in Alaska. Frankly, there's one other point to be made about, about this. That is that the permanent fund dividend already plays this role of investing in Alaska. The money's given out to Alaska citizens. Alaska citizens spend it in the local economy, make choices among various providers, uh, choose what Alaska businesses to support. Uh, and in that, in, in that means through that and through the uh, trickle-down effect, uh, have the have the means of supporting Alaska businesses. So we don't need direct investment by the Permanent Fund Corporation in investing in Alaska business prospects. We're already doing that through Alaska citizens, through the means of the PFD and allowing them to make those decisions. All right, final issue this week, the Walker administration's proposed solution to oil tax credits. This is something that, that we'll talk about more um, in subsequent uh, podcasts, I just want to touch it on touch on it here because it's starting to trickle up through an op-ed uh, written recently by Commissioner of Revenue Sheldon Fisher, uh, and uh, through various hearings that uh, are starting to occur in the legislature. This issue involves the outstanding oil tax credits uh, that are owed by the state to uh, producers under the oil tax credit program that was terminated last year, but has some uh, residue, about $800 million in residue uh, uh, payments that are ultimately due by the state uh, to the producers. Now, the statute governing that program provides that the state is obligated to make those payments over time, uh, depending upon the level of production tax revenues the state receives. If oil prices are up, the state owes more. If oil prices are down, production tax revenues are down. Uh, this, the, those payments get spread out uh, over time. The state is the state's obligation to pay is tied to the amount of revenues uh, that the state is getting. There's been a lot of controversy about this program because the producers assert uh, and and in various ways uh, seek to get those payments early earlier than provided by statute. Uh, they, they raise a number of arguments about that. Uh, we've opposed that. We say that uh, the state ought to comply with the statute, pay it out on the statutory uh, payment schedule. Um, uh, but the producers have argued that they want those payments accelerated. And the administration's proposal, frankly, is to find a way to accelerate those payments by the administration issuing debt uh, issuing bonds that would then gather money uh, uh, through the issuance of those bonds, uh, and then the state would pay that money uh, to the producers on an accelerated rate uh, as opposed to paying them as they come due. It essentially transfers the risk of and the cost of the time value of money from the producers who otherwise would have to wait on these payments to the state uh, who would make these? Who would issue bonds, make these payments early, and then have to pay the bonds back over time uh, uh, to the bo to the bondholders, as opposed to being able to make the payments according to the statutory schedule? We think we think this bond issuance is is a very uh, bad thing to do. Commissioner of Revenue's got some arguments for it. We'll address those in subsequent programs. But let's just focus for a moment. On, on what's going on. The state's going into debt, issuing bonds in order to pay producers early, earlier than the statute requires. We're seeing the effects of the federal government increasing debt, uh, uh, the significant increase in debt that's gone on uh, at the federal government level through the reduction in taxes and through uh, overspending. Uh, that was that was uh, captured in the last uh, congressional spending bill. Debt is not a good thing. Debt is not your friend. It simply shifts obligations that are that should be paid by the current generation, kicks the can down the road, and shifts it down to future generations. We think that's not the right way to go. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three. Thank you again for joining us this week. Remember that you can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 on our YouTube and SoundCloud pages 
and keep track of us during the week on Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook and Twitter pages. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week.